as we know, in 1985, the World Wrestling Federation took a big risk when they held the first ever WrestleMania in Madison Square Garden. And as we all know today, the show turned out to be a massive success for the company uh, based off the uh, popularity of Hulk Hogan, the whole Hulkamania thing, and of course the uh, collaboration with Mr. T, Cindy Lauper, the whole rest of the rock and wrestling connection. Things were looking good here for the World Wrestling Federation trying to kick off this new trend. And now as pay-per-view is a growing industry getting away from closed circuit, this is the WWF's chance to really just hammer home that they are the market leaders here. And we're going to see how well they can accomplish that goal as we do not once, not twice, but three times the mania for number two. It's WrestleMania 2 happening on Monday, April 7th, 1986 from three, count them, three venues. The Nassau Coliseum in Uniondale, New York, the Rosemont Horizon in Rosemont, Illinois, and the Memorial Sports Arena in Los Angeles, California. This show was nominated by Jeremy Russell, Daniel Stack, Alex Fireheart, and Charles Grybowski over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. Because you see, the real reason they're doing three cities, let's be honest, Starcade 85 had it in two cities in one night, so of course the WWF's got to be bigger and badder, so we got to have it in three cities. No, sir, this is definitely not a case of them trying to keep up with the Joneses, or in this case, the Crockett's. Also a very fun point in wrestling history for us music lovers, because the wrestling album had just dropped. They recently held the first ever Slammy Awards to help promote it, and you'll hear plenty of songs from that album used in hype packages in the weeks of build. Speaking of music, you know, watch Watching back some of the original broadcasts of WWF programming during this time, like Championship Wrestling, it blows my mind just how many songs that we like today in 2024 associate with being like iconic 80s songs just like being used regularly um, as like the bumper music for these shows they're putting out. And like, I guess I'm not too surprised that they would use that music around then trying to stay hip and popular. But like, you know, to steal a line, a coin of phrase from John Mulaney, were music rights just free back then? A combined 40,000 folks attended the show across the three venues. A lot of different numbers exist for buy rate. It seems like a blend of pay-per-view buys and closed circuit attendance. I've seen 250k, I've seen 319k, let's just say that they did okay. The show begins in New York, and the commentary team for this city is going to be Vince McMahon and actress, star of the hit show, Kate and Alley, Susan St. James. It's worth pointing out that St. James has no experience calling any wrestling prior to this show, but she is the wife of Dick Ebersol, who at this time was the head of NBC Sports and longtime friend and business partner of Vince McMahon, to give you an idea of how she might have got this gig. Vince introduces Ray Charles to sing America the Beautiful. We get those images of Americana on the screen as he sings it. Of course, it ends with the true symbol of our great nation, Hulk Hogan. We then go to Mean Gene Okerlund reporting from the Rosemont Horizon in suburban Chicago. We go back to New York to hear from Roddy Piper. He's there with the ace Bob Orton getting ready for his fight with Mr. T. He says he's growing his hair out long to avoid being confused for T. He promises to give up boxing, wrestling, tiddlywinks, and girls if he loses. He says Mr. T may have worn the kilt to get at Piper, but Roddy says, how now? Never shave my head like an Indian and paint myself black. Well, you certainly won't do one of those things, Roddy. Your opening matchup sees Paul Orndorff fighting for Hulk Hogan's honor here as he takes on Don Morocco. Of course, it was Morocco who was involved in the big beatdown on Hulk Hogan at Saturday night's main event back in Phoenix that led to the Hogan Bundy match we are going to see later tonight. So, Orndorff, Hogan's friend, is fighting for him here. The matchup begins, and right away we begin to hear audio of some promos with Orndorff and Morocco, but we don't see the video. I guess like they're supposed to throw to a video channel, but for whatever reason they couldn't get that up the right way, so you only heard the audio. And that was very interesting. It was like a weird book on tape thing happening in the middle of this wrestling match. Don't forget the sinister Mr. Fuji in my corner, uh -huh. Nassau Coliseum. I've been going to the gym more than I ever have in my life. Orndorff with some early heat and narrowing his eyes for Mr. Fuji. That's not on Peacock. Uh, Susan St. James, by the way, way, if I wasn't alluding to it enough a moment ago, she's terrible. Right away you can tell she is just unqualified, unprepared, unable to do anything of note on commentary. Vincent Mann doing a lot of the heavy lifting for this part, part of the show here. Um, you know, hey, verbal crutches on commentary. 
I get that. I fall victim to a few phrases I try and coach myself not to say. It's just what my brain is doing to try and like bridge the gap to the next statement I'm going to say. Uh, that happens to us all in commentary. So with Susan St. James, I don't blame her for going back to uh-oh every five seconds. Uh-oh. 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 Well. Morocco counters an arm bar with a big Samoan drop to take over. Orndor fires back with the punches. The brawl moves to the outside, and we get a double countout to a raucous bullshit chant and a lot of confusion from Finkel before we toss to a Mr. T promo. I give it a half star out of five, and here's the thing, just to keep in mind for the rest of this review, uh, there is an expectation today that modern WrestleManias, every single match has got to be the biggest and the best, they got to be bangers, what have you. That is the standard that we have set for WrestleMania. That standard did not exist in 1986. There was none of that. So of course they're going to throw these fuck finishes in where there's like double count outs and disqualifications because that's, they didn't know any better. And I think that obviously the standard, what fans want, Wanted, you could hear this in real time. The fans wanted something better than this. And um, obviously the standard has changed. But a lot of these early WrestleMania matches, they're going to feel like this at times. So, you know, a lot of these matches in this show in particular aren't going to get the highest of ratings because, you know, they won't be exciting or they'll be too short. And it's not even a thing of, oh, the modern lens looking back at these older shows. Just from a storytelling perspective, it's frustrating from a fan perspective. So we go to that Mr. T promo. He's with his trainer, Smokin' Joe Frazier. Hey, he's an alumni here in the Classic Review. He's also joined by the Haiti kid who famously got shorn by Roddy Piper and Bob Orton a few weeks ago uh, to get that Mr. T look. Mr. T is upset and means business tonight. In a match for the Intercontinental Championship, the new champ, Macho Man Randy Savage, defending against George the Animal Steel. This is a feud that goes back to Saturday night's main event when it became very obvious that George had a fondness, a crush, if you will, on Miss Elizabeth, uh, the Macho Man's manager at ringside. And of course, that's got to be in Macho Man's bonnet. And uh, here, that's why we have this matchup. We get our one iconic moment of the matchup, the one they'll show in highlights, of Steel chasing Savage out of the ring multiple times with his career crazy antics. Steel biting Savage in the leg at one point. George is distracted by Liz on the outside, which allows Macho to take over in the ropes. Savage with a dive. The two have a little awkward tumble. Savage hides under the ring to get a cheap shot. Animal counters the clothesline with his teeth. That's pretty innovative. Savage grabs a bouquet of flowers from someone out in the crowd. He smacks George around with it. George fights back and hits him with the bouquet. Steel with his trademark eating of the turnbuckle, shoving the contents in the champ's face. Once again, George enamored with Liz, which allows Macho to hit the bombs away. Steel kicks out of the elbow drop, for goodness sake. First guy to ever do that, but Savage has the last laugh when he hits the cover with his feet on the ropes to win. I'm going to give it one and a half stars out of five. If nothing else, this matchup is a great showcase of both men's character work. Uh, Macho Man, classic heel douchebaggery, the way he works with Liz here. George doing a good job building up the sympathy of, you know, the, the simple man who has a crush on the lovely lady and the heel is very protective of that and everything. I mean, it, it was exactly what it was meant to be. I'm just shocked that this feud went on for so long in 86. This was like the dominant angle of Macho Man's run as Intercontinental Champion until the Ricky Steamboat feud going into WrestleMania 3. I feel that his one Intercontinental Championship reign should have been done with better justice. Back in Chicago, MGO is in between Big John Studd and the NFL's Bill Fralick talking about the Battle Royal later tonight. Studd is a big shouty man. Fralick calls Studd Dud. After a little banter between McMahon and St. James, it's time for our next matchup here as George Wells takes on Jacob the Snake of Roberts making his Wrestlemania debut. In fact, Jake had only debuted for the company maybe a week or two before this, so he is brand new to the WWF and a very interesting way to kind of introduce him to a larger crowd here at Wrestlemania. Wells off to a hot start. Jake taking a lot of blows. Nice head scissors by Wells here. Jake leading George on a chase around the ring. That leads to the big knee strike. Then Jake hits the DDT and applies a very sexual snaky cover for the win. Jake immediately pulls out Damien who does not have a name yet but he wraps it around George's neck. Wells getting the goop squeezed out of him here. It's really scary. Jake the Snake and his friend, the Snake, take their leave. 
half star out of five, you know, like I said about the last match, this was what it was meant to be in that it was a quick thing to introduce Jake to a larger audience and get him over and everything. But again, it's the kind of matches that you're still surprised even this far back that they would put on a WrestleMania. It's like, you know, you'll see surprise short matches at Mania sometimes, but you won't see a guy debuting and going up against a jobber at WrestleMania. They show a recap of Roddy Piper and Bob Orton jumping Mr. T back at Saturday night's main event in Phoenix. Then we have training footage between Piper and Mr. T. We can actually hear some of Piper's For Everybody song playing for his segment. <laughs> In Los Angeles, Jesse Ventura interviews the champ Hulk Hogan. I can't believe you're fighting Bundy with broken ribs, Hogan. Hogan says he's fighting for America, and he predicts that Mr. T will beat Piper. Before the main event for the New York portion begins, Howard Finkel welcomes Joan Rivers as the guest ring announcer. She introduces the judges for the boxing match, former basketball star Chocolate Thunder Daryl Dawkins, legendary jazz singer Cap Calloway, architect of Watergate G. Gordon Liddy, and here comes comes the guest timekeeper, the elusive Burger Man from the Burger King commercials. Here's Herb. And all the stars. You really keep up with all that. Are stuff. here tonight. Oh, yes. It's time now for our first of three main events. It's the boxing match as Rowdy Roddy Piper takes on Mr. T, a continuation of their classic encounter at WrestleMania 1. Needless to say, these two do not like each other here, and a lot of the animosity does come from the Piper side of things. It goes back to the first WrestleMania. Piper did not trust Mr. T. Still does not trust Mr. T one year later. And I get it from Piper's perspective because of where and how he came up in professional wrestling, protecting the business, a lack of trust of outsiders, and in Piper's case, a lack of trust of insiders uh, for, for in many cases, but just still did not want to do business with Mr. T and was very much drag kicking and screaming to do it. It's crazy. This rivalry, this beef between the two stretches on for literal decades as a result of what happens at Mania's 1 and 2. Piper is sent to a boxing camp in Reno, Nevada to train with Lou Duva for this one. That's where you see the footage of him working out and getting ready. The fight begins and we get a lot of rough boxing, but it's not for lack of trying. The story is Piper actually had his hands taped into fists before putting the boxing gloves on. By having his fists already taped up, that meant that his punches were really ineffective. They did not want to risk Piper hurting Mr. T or hitting him really hard. After a lot of nothing, round one concludes. Round two begins, the referee catching Piper with a lot of salve on his forehead. Piper unloading on T in this round, even knocks him down for a bit. Piper clearly wins the round and the fans approve here. He gets another shot in for good measure. Bob Orton throwing the water bucket on Mr. T for no reason as round three begins. Now T with the advantage. The fans are really turning on Mr. T here, but he decks Piper right in the mush with a left hook and down he goes. Roddy barely hanging on till the end of the round. Piper, I heard him say in an interview with Steve Austin recently that that was the big left hook that was supposed to bring Piper down and he says, oh, he missed the left hook. Apparently there was a woman holding up a giant glove round sign between rounds this whole time and it's the first time we ever see it. Piper hucking the stool at Mr. T in between rounds for shootsies. That looks stiff. Round four begins. Both men throwing bombs at each other. Finally, Piper has had enough. He shoves the referee and body slams Mr. T to get himself disqualified. I give it two stars out of five. This is by far the most entertaining part of the show to this point, but entertaining doesn't always mean good. Uh, this was, like I said, a rough boxing matchup here. It was definitely rigged in a sense that Piper wasn't going to get any good shots in, had to look good for Mr. T, and I think the fans kind of saw through that. I think they were able to, you know, the fact that they turned on T so much in this one, I think was very evident that one. But Piper and Orton, at least, they carried their parts. They were great in this. Uh, it's crazy to think about hearing that Piper and Mr. T would have this grudge uh, between them up and all the way until WrestleMania 30. That's when they finally patched things up. That's insane to me. Also, damn, New York got screwed for this WrestleMania. Like, those are your four matches, like two bullshit finishes and one featuring, you know, a jobber, George Wells. Like, I'd be pissed. Quick, everyone, into the Chicago portal. Whoa! Gorilla Monsoon and Gene Okerlund at ringside at the horizon. Monsoon welcomes his broadcast colleague, pro tennis player turned actor, Kathy Lee Crosby. 
She can't be any worse than Susan St. James. Chet Kopic is the ring announcer here, one of the many AWA guys who were lured away by Vince and then ultimately dumped. Your first match is for the Women's Championship as the fabulous Moolah defends against Velvet McIntyre, who apparently had to forego a booking at a women's wrestling show in Kuwait, running at the same time as Mania here. And they, they told her, you, you're not going to that one, you're going here. And apparently, she was not happy about that, not thrilled about the prospect of working with Moolah. Moolah off and running with the big hair mares. Velvet comes back with a couple of big moves. She goes for a splash off the second rope, but misses and almost falls out of her top in the process. Moolah falls on her with a cover. Velvet's foot clearly on the ropes, but the cover continues and Moolah wins in about 90 seconds. I give it a half star out of five. I have to give them a little bit of credit for the effort they put in before the finish. Now, who knows how much longer that match was going to go or who was even going to win it, but it definitely feels that that splash was the beginning of the end. And you know, the story is her bra strap broke on impact and they just had to go home early because of that. And uh, it's disappointing that it ended the way it did because those first few moments were actually pretty exciting stuff. Now, Mac McIntyre would go on to become the women's champion. She would beat Mula at a house show on Australia later in the year, but would drop it back to her less than a week later. I love this shot of the announcers. Kathy Lee does not want to wear the headset on air so her hair keeps looking nice, but you just see the spare label on top of that headset. In a flag match, Nikolai Volkov with Freddie Blassie in his corner takes on Corporal Kirchner, the future Leatherface, and for now, the new Sergeant Slaughter. Volkov blatantly biting Corporal's face on the outside of the ring. Freddie Blassie on the outside taunting Kirchner, telling him to get in there, you yellow dog. Now that's Brian Pillman. Kirchner fights back. He accidentally hits the referee. He is not DQ'd. Blassie throws in the cane. Corporal intercepts it, though, hits Volkov with it, and gets the pinfall victory. USA! USA! Wait, wasn't this a flag match? I thought you had to grab the flag to win a flag match. Um, let's give it one star. Why not? Up next, a 20-man over-the-top battle royal where the stars of the World Wrestling Federation and the National Football League collide. Mean Gene welcomes the guest timekeeper who has definitely found the beef. It's Claire Pell, the Where's the Beef Lady. How'd they land two burger spokespeople on this show? I will never know. Former football stars Dick Butkus and Ed Too Tall Jones are the guest referees here. Here are your participants. Chicago Bear, Jimbo Covert, Pedro Morales, Tony Atlas, Ted R.C. Former Dallas Cowboy Harvey Martin, Golden Boy Dan Spivey, Hillbilly Jim, The Iron Sheik, Former Steeler Ernie Holmes, The Killer Bees, Big John Stud, Atlanta Falcon Bill Fralick, The Hart Foundation, Russ Francis of the 49ers, Bruno San Martino in his one and only pay per view match, Chicago Bear William Perry, Andre the Giant, and the man called King Tonga. He's the man called King Tonga. Ernie Ladd joins commentary. We get a lot of standing and shoving around. Russ Francis going for the giant early on. Morales and Martin take each other out. Ted Arcidi, the world's strongest man, can't deadlift a guy in the gorilla press. Freilich is gone. Stud dumps out Bruno. William Perry with some big tackles. He collides into Big John Stud. Perry's hit with the elbow and Stud eliminates him. Perry goes for the handshake. Psyche pulls John out of the ring. A double drop kick by Bretton Anvil sends Andre into the ropes. Then they take out Russ Francis. Francis. The Hart Foundation looked to have it won, but Andre fights back, throws Jim out, then Andre picks up Brett from the top and dumps him out onto his partner to win the Battle Royal. I give it one and a half stars out of five. There were some fun moments in this Battle Royal, but for so many people in this thing who are basically untrained, the ceiling can only be so high. You know, William Perry, the fridge, he is the Hall of Famer out of this matchup, but my MVP for the Battle Royal is Russ Francis, because he was moving and shaking. He was taking this shit seriously. He was all over the place in this thing. Also, I think it would be a really fun idea next year on the 40th anniversary of this matchup to do another like big battle royal with like WWE guys and like NFL guys. I think modern NFL players today being a part of that after what we've seen like other athletes from outside ventures coming in and doing well, like why not? It'd be fun. Back to New York, Vince McMahon interviews Roddy Piper, who is just classic Roddy here. If I wanted to come for a picnic tea, I would have packed a lunch. Rubbing his head, rubbing them gnarly bristles, dropping him on his head really doesn't do a lot of damage. 
Back to Chicago, MGO with Jimbo Covert. Covert complains he was cheated. Thanks, man. Good to hear from you. Now in comes the Iron Sheik who says some words. It's time for our Chicago main event for the WWF Tag Team Championship as the Dream Team with Johnny Valiant takes on the British Bulldogs with Ozzy Osbourne and Captain Lou Albano in their corner. You love to see it. Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine have been the champs for seven months now. The Bulldogs have had a couple of non-title wins over the champs as of late, leading to this big title match. But all I can think of at the moment seeing the entrances is, boy, do you think Ozzy and Lou had a good time at the after party. Davey Boy and the Dynamite Kid working over Greg for a good while, stalling vertical by Davey. Brutus comes in, he takes a big fisherman suplex. Valentine with a big whomp onto Smith, which allows him to take over. Greg's worked over some more by the baby faces, but manages to fight back, hits a damn hollow point. Valentine goes up, but Dynamite catches him and beals him off. All four men fighting at once for a moment. Davey hitting the hammer with the power slam, but Valentine kicks out. Brutus tagged in a beautiful snap. Nightmare block. Hammer arrogantly pulling Smith up from the pinfall attempt. Goes to do something else, but Davy Boy runs Greg face first in a dynamite's head, falls atop him, and gets the cover to win, and they become new tag team champions. Captain Lou feels so good, feels so fine. Billy, Billy, Billy! Ozzy Osbourne says, Bulldogs forever! Three stars out of five for me. This is one of my favorite matches of the night. It's really one of the best ones, objectively, across all three cities. Uh, these two teams have really good chemistry together. Uh, you can see it watching the build and the matches they had had up to this point. Really good matches, those ones, and this one, no exception. I was also a really big fan of how they executed the finish. We go back to Vince and Susan in New York who are speaking on the tag title match you just saw. What does Susan think? Fantastic! British Fantastic! <laughs> now we dive through the Los Angeles tube for the final leg of our event. Whoa! Jesse Ventura, Lord Alfred Hayes, and Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, are on the call. And just from the eyeball test, this is easily the best commentary team of the night. Lee Marshall is your ring announcer in LA. And boy, that is not a glorious looking opening shot of the arena. Look at all those empty seats. And even though I do like this commentary team, most uh, any of the other cities, uh, from an audio quality standpoint, it is the worst. You hear a lot of distortion and just not good audio on, on the headsets uh, in this particular scene city. It's kind of a bummer. Though I have to admit, I love hearing Jesse calling Alfred Hayes just Lord. Like, let me tell you something, Lord. Your first match in LA is Ricky Steamboat versus Hercules Hernandez. Apparently, according to Bret Hart, he was supposed to take on Steamboat in a singles match at Mania. That was an original plan, apparently. But for whatever reason that didn't happen, Bret and Jim Neidhart were in the Battle Royal in Chicago. And you have this one with Hercules instead. Herc with the big blows to start things off. Steamboat answers with the big arm drags. Nice leapfrog by Hercules. He's got hops. Hernandez comes back from Steamboat's offense with a big-ass clothesline laying Ricky out. Hercules with two big press slams just hurling Ricky down. Herc goes up top for a splash, but he takes the knees. Steamboat goes up top, hits the big cross body. Same movie hit Matt Bourne with one year ago. The cover and the win. I give it two stars out of five. It was a solid match. There wasn't really a story to this one. I mean, going back on the build, didn't really see much of Steamboat or Hernandez going into this show, but either way, I think it was still a fine matchup. It seems like the quality of the show overall is beginning to improve, but that feeling does not last long. Over to Jesse Ventura, now. Go now. Let's go to an interview with Lord Alfred Hayes and Hulk Hogan. Boop, boop. We are getting no audio of this promo, then we cut to the wide shot of the ring, then we hear the promo, but we get no video, then they just cut it and go to the next match. We'll go back to it later. Up next, adorable Adrian Adonis with Jimmy Hart in his corner taking on Uncle Elmer. Adrian has taken on this very effeminate, adorable gimmick as of late, allegedly given to him as punishment for gaining weight. His makeup is so red and caked on, I thought he looked like a burn victim at first. Elmer with some gentle mockery to start things off. Adonis bumping his ass off from the get-go here. Elmer throws a punch so hard he knocks himself down. Elmer starts ripping the jumper off Adrian's body and gets him tied up in the ropes. Adonis dodging a big splash from Elmer hits a top rope headbutt of his own to win. Half star out of five. You know, for a match as ugly as this one is, I still gotta give credit to Adonis for just running circles around Elmer in this thing and the way he sold for him throughout. Um, nevertheless, this match, ironically, is one of the first that comes to mind 
mind for me in my head whenever I hear someone earnestly calling this show the showcase of the immortals. Let's try that Hulk Hogan promo again. Hogan says that even if he had to crawl the building with one good arm, he was going to be in LA to defend the title against King Kong Bundy. In our next matchup, Terry and Hoss Funk with Jimmy Hart takes on Tito Santana and the Junkyard Dog. Early on, we get a great miscommunication spot between the Funk brothers. Terry gets knocked around a lot. More big bumps by Terry. Dory Jr. finally comes in and starts to work over Santana. Tito with the flying forearm on Haas, but a save by Terry. I am interrupting your crisscross with a cheap shot now. Jimmy Hart with some kicks to Tito on the outside. Santana taking a lot of punishment here. A nice spot where he's got to outmaneuver Terry while crawling across the ring to get that big hot tag to JYD. Terry goes flying outside the ring with a backdrop. He's slammed onto a table. I'm kind of surprised the match doesn't just end by DQ right there for reasons. Jimmy Hart goes down. All four men in the ring. The referee is distracted. Jimmy throws the megaphone to Terry who dinks JYD with it and gets the cover for the stolen victory. Three stars out of five for me. This was a fun match. What does that say for this show when the two tag team matches are objectively like the best and most entertaining on the entire card? I think the Funks were just a joy to watch in this one. Tito Santana, a great valiant babyface, the way he fought back and fought through everything. That was just a really classic story. I like this match a lot. It's almost time for the final main event, the steel cage match for the WWF Championship as Hulk Hogan defends against King Kong Bundy. But first, we gotta go kill some time while they set up the cage. Let's go to a video package. Back at Saturday night's main event in March, Hulk Hogan was wrestling Don Morocco when King Kong Bundy brutally attacked Hogan. Bundy and Morocco and Bobby Heenan all working to destroy the champion, breaking his ribs, sending him to the hospital. Truly, it's one of the biggest beatings Hogan had ever received while champion, and it was treated like a huge deal. Me and Gene reporting from Hogan's private gym, Hogan doing deadlifts with Hillbilly Jim and his doctor looking on, the doctor reiterating that he should not be competing at WrestleMania. By the way, how many people will just lift weights with their jacked doctor? But the Hulkster says he's got a commitment to all the Hulkamaniacs, proceeds to do pull-ups with an additional 100 pounds of weight around his neck. Good lord, that's impressive no matter who you are. Also, in case you're keeping score, Hogan got three promos across this show tonight. Four if you count the one they aired twice. We go back to Jesse reporting with Bobby Heenan and King Kong Bundy. The brain very excited to carry the gold for the next champion of the world. By the way, the story of Bobby Heenan working Mania 2 is pretty phenomenal when you realize that the day before LA, he was in Tampa having done this MRI for his neck because you know, his neck was so messed up. He had to get surgery and everything. But they said, if you don't make this show, you're fired. So he left, he flew to LA, did the show, and went back to the hospital in Tampa where he was the day after. That is some king shit right there. Bundy with an awesome promo saying that every time he's faced off with Hogan, it's been Hogan who's been laid out. Heenan says it's gonna be Bundy mania from here on out. We toss back to Vince and Susan. They laugh at the idea of Bundy mania, which tells you exactly what's gonna happen here. And they finally killed all the time they need. It's time now for the main event. Guest ring announcer, LA Dodgers manager, Tommy Lasorda, who gets a nice local reaction. Action. The guest timekeeper is child actor and starring in what Tommy calls a TV serious, Silver Spoons, Ricky Schroeder. The guest referee is actor Robert Conrad. The rules in this match are escape to win. No pinfalls here. Hogan with the heavily taped ribs coming into the match starts off with the big right hands. Bundy begins to attack the ribs and keeps on him like a shark to water. King Kong is the first to try to escape the cage, but Hogan stops him. Bundy strips Hogan of his rib tape and chokes him out with it. Even tries tying him to the ropes with it. He almost escapes, but Hogan with the stop. Hogan ramming Bundy face first into the cage wall. It's time for Bundy to blatantly gig in front of the camera as Heenan tries to cover him up. Bundy is now bleeding and Hogan throwing him from pillar to post. Goes to body slam the big man, but he's just too much. Elvira says the blood makes her hungry. Bundy with the avalanche. Hogan no sells it, reverses a whip, and power slams Bundy on the rebound. Hits that leg drop. Goes to climb over the top. Bundy tries to stop him, but he's pushed off the turnbuckle. It's a race to the floor now. Hogan escapes and wins the match. Hogan chasing Heenan into the ring and beats him up for a bit. The man with the bad neck, mind you, throws him out and poses to wrap up the show as Elvira calls that the match of the decade. That was the first and to this date, the only traditional cage match in WrestleMania history. And uh, it was fine. I think it was a good story. You know, Hogan being the resilient champion, Bundy, the big nasty monster who like put him 
him in the hospital and beat him up and was trying to exploit that injury. You know, it was just a good, classic, hard-hitting cage match, Hogan versus the monster du jour. I think that formula worked really well for the time, and it was a successful match. Well, it ain't one, and it ain't three. It's WrestleMania 2, which I give a D. I watched a lot of this show with Mr. Ooh La La the other day, and he made a really good point that WWE didn't really know what they wanted WrestleMania to be yet. So they thought maybe just dumping more celebrities on the show is the answer. Any old celebrity will do. And hey, it doesn't matter how we actually build our matches and what finishes we use, because it's WrestleMania, and that's just all we need to do to sell it. Uh, let's simulcast in three different cities, because that's seemingly more impressive than doing it in two. When you do that though you're stretching your show so thin so for each city to have four matches they all better be damn good matches and for the most part they were not in fact i think la probably wins the contest of the best card among three cities because two of the three matches i put in the pros came from that city and not only that you are really testing the limits of your live capabilities and your production abilities when you broadcast across three cities like that and spin all those plates and as evidenced by a lot of the production botches you will see on this show they were not prepared to handle that in the grand scheme of things. You know, Mania 2 was certainly a financial success. It showed that the WWF was on the right track with this whole newfangled pay-per-view technology. But just from a quality standpoint, this is not one of the better WrestleManias. I would probably put it somewhere in the bottom half, probably the bottom fourth overall. But hey, you know which WrestleMania does not belong in the bottom quadrant? Actually, I think it belongs in the top fourth of Manias of all time, WrestleMania 18. It is by far one of the most requested Manias I've ever gotten on Patreon over the years from the backers, and I'm finally going to be looking at it. Ric Flair versus The Undertaker. Chris Jericho defends the undisputed title against Triple H, and then of course, You've got that bonkers match between two legends, Hollywood Hogan versus The Rock. I'm really looking forward to that one. But what did you think of my review of WrestleMania 2? What did you think of Mania 2 in general? Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Hit that bell icon for all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.